So now that I covered up part two, let's get to part three. In this one, I'm going to be talking about the locations and, of course, the story itself. Well, I kind of did talk about the story where, uh, you know what, forget it. Like, I'll just talk about locations and, well, the animation, too, and the voice acting. And, of course, the low points I got with this movie, period. All right. <laughs> All right, first is locations. Not only was it Olstead Castle, but I also now, now that I just remembered, we're also introduced to Vickerstown Bridge. Vickerstown Bridge, I mean, I'm glad they named it Vickerstown because, in all honesty, I could see that the town of Vickerstown has probably become the most popular part, I mean, has become probably the most popular landmark with all of us Thomas fans. Yeah, I mean, the question... Yeah, I, I, I could see it at that. Yeah. I mean, the bridge is designed uniquely. I mean, I like the red color. And I mean, the fact that it's a drawbridge over a river. I mean, that's amazing. And now we'll get to the biggest, I mean, the main attraction of it all. Olstead Castle. What can I say? This is the most awesomest landmark I've ever seen. Way better than Misty Island Oh my god, don't get me started, I absolutely hate that place. And I absolutely hate Bash Dash and Ferdinand as well. I swear to god, those guys are absolutely annoying. And Misty Island is shit. Alright, so I'm not gonna get angry here. Alright, alright, I'll just, you know, calm down. Alright, Olstead Castle, back to it. Let's get to the gut. Alright, Olstead Castle is one of the best designs I have ever seen. I mean, a railway, a railway line, uh, no, no, here's what I'm going to say, a castle with railway lines, which also impresses me is not only that there's standard gauge track, but also narrow gauge in there as well. I mean, there's a turntable, the drawbridge has railway lines on it, I mean, I mean, well, track, oh, whatever, I mean, this whole estate is, uh, I mean, really, this is what I mean. When I think that Andrew Brunner must have really been having a lot of fun with this. I mean, the creativity that went into, you know, Olsted Castle is really unique. I mean, all these, you know, railway tracks and... And I even love, you know, how they were doing the construction of the castle and seeing it's, you know... I mean, that there's a station. Wow. I mean, I'm glad that in the movie that the Earl decided to have this, you know, as a tourist attraction. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot at that place. I mean, I even like the name of it. Olfstead Castle. <laughs> yeah. Olfstead Castle, so far, is... I give this, this landmark a full 10. I mean, what more can you say? Just like the Blue Mountain Quarry, this is one of the best landmarks in a CGI series that I have ever seen so far in my life. Yeah, so that makes it two, two favorites of mine. Blue Mountain Quarry and... Oh yeah, Blue Mountain Quarry and Olsted Castle are my two favorite CGI landmarks. But I, even though I still love the classic series landmarks. <laughs> Alright, so now we'll get to the voice acting. The voice acting... I also admit not only did Andrew Brunner and Mark Marr again, but also... I even think that even the animators and the voice actors had a lot of fun. But we'll focus on the voice actors first. The voice actors, I think, really did a good job. And before you ask, I only watched the UK version of this. Yeah, why the UK? Because, well, actually, in all honesty, I really prefer the UK voices. They actually really suit the characters. The US version, I'm sorry to say, they, the US version can suck it. Sorry, I mean, if I'm, you know, saying that, I mean... I mean, if you guys like it, it's fine. I mean, just in the U.S. version, Thomas still sounds like Elijah Wood. Well, thanks to Martin Sherman. Oh, yeah, I'll talk about Martin Sherman in a second. Yeah, I mean, all of them, I mean, they do a really good job. And this brings me up to the subject of the voice acting with Martin Sherman, who now, who voiced Thomas and Percy, now is the voice of Diesel. Yep, that's right. After Michael Brandon had left you know, the scene as the U.S. narrator. What will we do about Diesel's U.S. voice? Well, for a minute, I thought Michael Brandon was still going to be, just remain as Diesel's voice actor in the U.S. But, actually, no. 
Now Diesel is voiced by Martin Sherman, who also did the voice of Thomas and Percy, like I said earlier. I mean, I really still prefer the devious voice George Carlin gave him. I mean, Michael Brandon, don't get me wrong, I, I love, you know, his voice for Diesel, but now, while Martin Sherman really didn't capture it, uh, like, too much, I mean, he did, but not as, I mean, it's just not as good as Brandon. I mean, it's kind of got a little bit of a Brooklyn accent, the same way George Carlin's Oliver did, I mean, Impression did. But so far, I mean, it's just good. It's tolerable. Just like, you know, Michael Brandon is Diesel. I mean, Martin Sherman really isn't one of my favorite voice actors in the whole com Thomas, you know, voice actor community. But whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but he did. It. But he tries. I mean, the rest of the voice actors, I think, did a really good job. Mike Grady, Miranda Rayson, Jonathan Forbes, Rebecca O'Mara, and... Bob Golding all did a really good job as the new characters. And now we'll get to the animation. Now, this is something, of course, that's really, you know, a big topic. Nitrogen Studios, as you all remember, are now done. I mean, they're no longer doing the Thomas series anymore. So now we have a new animation company, which is also in Canada, called Arc Productions. This is an animation company in Toronto, which which has also been the animation for other films, like Nomeo and Juliet, which I actually really despise that movie. Sorry, guys, I really... that movie's shit. And, of course, they even did the animation for Nine. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I'm swearing, you guys. I, I really... Yeah, I'll stop swearing. All right. So, the animation, I gotta say, probably even better than Nitrogen Studios. Like, ARC really did a good job. I mean, when you look at, you know, the way the engines were rendered, it's like you're looking at models on a model railway layout. I mean, like, the whole layout of, you know, the whole island is, and stuff is really brought on very well. I mean, what more could you even ask for? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so, like, this is probably the better, you know, of the CGI animation. Like, the better out of the two. I mean, the best of the best. <laughs> the only problem I have with our productions is not really a big problem, you know, regarding it. But, I mean, of course, fans were able to pick this up, too. And that is some animation errors. Yeah, that's right. Even though I love art productions animating the series... Oh, excuse that, there's... Someone's walking upstairs. I mean, not the... Oh, hold on. Yes, sorry about that, guys. Yeah, that was my dad. He was just here a minute ago, and I just had to pause the video, so I didn't want to get any disturbances, but... Oh, well. Anyways, so, yeah, this is what I was going to talk about, the animation errors. Now, even though I absolutely love art productions, just like I said earlier, yes, they actually have animation errors, which I wouldn't consider a big flaw, but I wish they would at least fix it. Here's one prime example of the animation errors. In this one scene where Spencer is headed from the mainland, or I think it was the mainland, I, I, I forgot, where he's headed from... You know, across Vickerstown Bridge, all the way to Tenement Sheds, you see in one shot that his wheels are black, just like the Hormy model, and the fact that his nameplate is completely blank. No lettering, no red paint, just nothing. But when he comes back, he's back to normal. Yeah, that's just the one animation error I'm able to find. Yeah, and that's not one of the biggest flaws, but... I mean, but don't get me wrong, this is still a good movie. But of course, even good movies do have their problems every now and then, and yeah, I love this movie, but there are some low points at least, but they're nothing major. So I'll just cover them at just right now. Alright, number one is this. This is something also along with the animation, is 
the engines just keep rocking down like a rocking horse. I mean, just because that this is a kid show, I mean, you don't have to take it literally where vehicles, yeah, or unlike in that other, sh or unlike in that other crappy show, Chugging Tin. And don't get me wrong, I absolutely hate Chugging Tin, where the engines are able to jump. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to let it out. Yeah. I mean, the way the engines keep bulging up and down like a rocking horse, I swear to God, it's so annoying. And yeah, that also brings us to another thing. It's just, this is also along with, you know, what happened in seasons 13 to 16. There are no uses for the drivers or firemen in this. Oh, God. All I can ask, for, just for season 18, and if you, if Hit was listening, and just please at least give the drivers and firemen a purpose, and stop making the engines, and even the rolling stop bulging up and down. Please, it's so annoying. Alright, so now that I got that out of the way, now let's get to just some parts with just the plot, yeah. There's this one problem in the plot, though. Like, one of the problems, like, you know, regarding, you know, s you know, the drivers and firemen being zombified is, with, of course, when Steven, I mean, like, Steven's driver could have at least been, you know, the voice of reason for him. Uh, oh well. But, as you might have guessed, it doesn't really bother me that much, so I won't really talk about it. And, of course, here's the one major kind of nitpick. It's this. It's where Thomas is in the Blue Mountain Quarry asking the Nargage engines. He asks Thomas, I mean, Scarloe, Reneus, and Luke if they've seen Steven. And when they, and when, I mean, the only thing is, is that Luke is the only one that's able to give Thomas the information. But Scarloe and Reneus absolutely stay mute in this. Like, they don't say anything. Like, because, I mean, if I can remember correctly, Scarloe was the one who told Steven that the only mine available was Olsted Castle mine. <laughs> I mean, the, the mine at Olsted Castle, period. I mean, like, if Scarloe, I mean, why did he have to keep, why did he have to keep his mouth shut? I mean, if Scarloe would have at least told Thomas where he was going, I mean, then, hell, they could have found him easily. But if I could forgive it for the fact that maybe Scarloe or and Reneus and all the other you know members at the Blue Mountain Quarry probably you know had like just, they all just simply had forgotten you know that they told Stephen you know that there is a mine at Ulstead Castle then you know what that would make perfect sense. Yeah. So. Yeah. But that's just the only you know problems I have, even though that the fact that this is a really good movie. Yeah. And now, we'll get to the last part. I forgot to bring up. I nearly did. But now, I finally got to it, and I'll save enough time. Is the music. Yeah. Not only is it just, you know, the songs, but also Robert Hearth... God damn it. Hearth... Shown. Har Robert Hart Robert Hartstone, yeah. There, Robert Hartstone. Yeah, Robert Hartstone really did a good job with the music compositions. Even though I still remain excuse me. Even though I still remain a huge fan of Michael Donald and Junior Campbell, Hartstone really did a good job at excuse me, hiccups. Composing the music for this. And I mean, the songs in this movie, now we'll talk about them. We're actually reintroduced to that song, Working Together, which of course you guys will remember as Blue Mountain Quarry from Blue Mountain Mystery. You know the... Na -na 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 -na. Except this time, they now change the lyrics. And now, normally I didn't complain about this before in, you know, my review of the Land Before Time TV series, where, you know, that they, you know, recycle the songs and reuse, you know, the same lyrics. And yeah, that was annoying, but in this, it sort of works. I mean, I mean, the song, 
let's face it, the song working together is pretty generic at times, but it's just so, you know, upbeat that you actually just can't help but listen to it. I mean, hell, it's so catchy, I could just hum it right now. Work, I mean not hung, but singing. Working together, rocking and rolling. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, I cannot help myself. Then we have another song called Searching Everywhere, which mm, I actually kind of liked it. Yeah, I mean, it's, orig it's an original song. I mean, like, I actually like this song, but it's not one of my favorites, though. But it's pretty catchy. Yeah, just like Working Together. And now we'll, we'll get to a song which I don't think is generic or mediocre at all. I think is probably the best of the whole movie, the best song of the whole movie, which is It's Gonna Be a Great Day. And I gotta say, this song is awesome. I actually love it. For one, it doesn't, you know, copy, you know, the actual title of the movie, no. I mean, I actually love this song. I mean, of how, you know, the moral of, you know, it's getting better and better. It's a very special day. <laughs> yeah, I can't really remember the rest. Yeah. But it's just so catchy, it's so a beat. I mean, hell, you'll be humming, you'll be humming, or probably even sing, be singing that song after the movie ends. <laughs> I mean, really, it's just a really good song, and it's not even generic or mediocre. Yeah, I mean, I really wish they wouldn't reuse Working Together again, and, but so far, this is awesome. Yeah. So, pretty much... This would have to be my favorite song in the movie. It's going to be a great day. Alright, so now you guys, I'll be right back. Stay tuned for part four, the last part where I give my final thoughts on the movie.